I was so happy with that song choice. Um, Isabel texted me probably, I don't know, four weeks ago or something, asking if um, I would like that song, which is perfect. Um, but it actually has a really personal uh, meaning to me. A couple of years ago, my mom was diagnosed with cancer for the second time. And uh, that song was one that I would listen to at night when I was trying to go to sleep and just had all sorts of fears. Um, and I would send that to my mom as well. And she enjoyed it, just thinking about our security and our refuge that we can have in Christ and his care for us. So, um, yeah, happy to sing that song. And it also, of course, has a connection with our text today, speaking about the tabernacle and the dwelling place of the Lord. And I have loved this year studying Hebrews so in depth, and I like that we have kind of slowed down a bit, just one chapter about each week, and we get to dive in and look at um, these great truths about the superiority of Jesus um, and why it's just wonderful and imperative for us to trust in him alone for salvation. And this text is not um, different in that regard. It points us back to the new covenant and the superiority of that covenant, as opposed to the Mosaic or the old covenant. And I think that's going to be the best way to help us frame this passage, which is chapter 9, verses 1 to 22. We're going to look at it from the perspective of the new covenant. Specifically, we're going to look at four accomplishments of the new covenant for the people of God. That's our outline for accomplishments of the new covenant for the people of God. And those four are going to be first reformed worship, and that's from the first 10 verses, 1 to 10. And secondly, eternal redemption, and that's from verses 11 to 12, and then 15 to 22. And then thirdly, a cleansed conscience, and we get that from verse 9, and then verses 13 and 14. And then lastly, our eternal inheritance from verse 15. Um, now, last week, we looked a lot at the New Covenant and why the New Covenant was superior to the Old. And Elena, I just love how she taught us so well, showing the superiority of Jesus and that only the covenant that's mediated by him is life-giving. That's never what the Old Covenant was meant to do. That wasn't the function of the Old Covenant. And so this message uh, in Hebrews 9 probably is going to seem a bit repetitive in what I say, but I think that's intentional on the part of the author because he keeps bringing up the same truths. And I think we can recognize why we need that. Um, some of these are difficult to grasp, so it's helpful to have it repeated often to us so that those, um, those ideas can really sink in and we can understand them. And it's important for us to have that fuller understanding of who God is uh, so that we can have a greater appreciation for our salvation, and I think then that informs our worship of the Lord. Um, so my hope today is not really to say anything new or that you don't know, but it's really just to solidify in our minds what Hebrews is portraying about the new covenant um, as it relates to the old, and it will hopefully bring us joy and then some practical direction as we look at that. So also be aware, please, that the way we're approaching this, it's not exactly linear in the first 22 verses. So the ideas that we're going to look at, we're going to jump around a little bit within the passage. So that's okay. Uh, just know that we're going to be going a bit back and forth because it's a bit circular in the ideas that the author is presenting to us. Um, so with that, please turn to Hebrews 9. And I will start by reading verses 1 to 22. Now, even the first covenant had requirements of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the first part in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread, which is called the holy place. And behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the holy of holies, having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod, which budded and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now, when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the first part of the tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. 
the Holy Spirit is indicating this, that the way into the holy places has not yet been manifested while that first part of the tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, requirements for the body imposed until a time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy places once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who, through the eternal spirit, offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the trespasses that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry he sprinkled with the blood. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The first thing that we're going to look at that was accomplished in the new covenant is reformed worship. And that's from the first 10 verses. These verses address the worship of Israel under the Mosaic covenant. But I wonder if you were like me, and when you got to this portion, you wondered, why the tabernacle uh, as opposed to the temple? Why would the author go back all the way to the tabernacle? Because when Hebrews was written, was the tent still in use? No, Um, the tabernacle was long gone by that point. It was the tent that was built by Moses uh, for Israel after God had saved them out of Egypt uh, when they wandered in the desert uh, before being established in the land of Israel. And so if you need a date, that's approximately 1445 BC. Then you remember that Solomon built the temple um, as kind of a grander and a more permanent dwelling for God amongst his people. And that was finished around 960 BC. That temple, which we call the first temple or Solomon's temple, was destroyed by the Babylonians when they conquered Jerusalem in 586. But then it was later rebuilt when the Jews were allowed to return to Jerusalem um, in 516 BC, and you can read about that in Ezra. Um, So that second temple was then later expanded by Herod the Great and was in use um, in the first century, destroyed in 70 AD. So all that to say when Hebrews is written, it's the temple that's really the nearest form of Jewish or Old Covenant ministry. So why is the author taking us all the way back to the tabernacle? Well, there's a few different reasons for this. I think simply it's that The author is talking in broad terms about the law and the Mosaic covenant, and the tabernacle was given at the same time as the giving of the law. So both of those things are associated with Mount Sinai, right? So the tabernacle and the law, they go together um, in timing. They're given at the same time. So I think that's why we go all the way back to the tabernacle when it was first, um, when the covenant was first instituted. And we read in verse one something that is really helpful about the purpose of the old covenant ministry. Look at verse one. Now, even the first covenant had requirements of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. And here you see a little bit that the author is changed a bit from his approach in chapter eight, which was all about the difference between the old covenant and the new. Here he says, actually, there's this point of continuity. The old covenant instructed the nation of Israel on how they were to approach God in worship. And you remember, we looked at this in the lesson, Uh, From Exodus 25, 8, the point of the tabernacle, God said, let them make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. And then a couple verses later in that same chapter, in verse 22, 
There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all which I will command you for the sons of Israel. So God is, of course, omnipresent. So we know that those verses are not saying that God is limited in his presence to just the Holy of Holies, to the tabernacle, but rather that God's relational presence abiding in the Holy of Holies was the way of communion between God and his people and showed nearness. Um, And the activities that were taking place in the tabernacle were all part of the corporate worship of God and to deal with sin so that God would continue with his people. Um, Israel had a good thing when God made the covenant at Sinai and the instructions uh, to build the tabernacle were a blessing because they signified that God would be amongst his people. He was going to give them instruction. Uh, He was going to receive their worship, cleanse their sin, which we'll talk about in a moment, and lead them. Uh, So you remember that with a tabernacle. And then look at kind of what's involved in the first 10 verses. The author here is presenting a pretty um, sweeping picture of what the tabernacle, what was in the tabernacle and what took place. Um, We could stop and go through each detail of the furniture and where it was and um, all the different things that happened within the tabernacle. And we could cross-reference Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers where those things are described in detail but we're not going to do that um, today. Why? Well, because of verse 5. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. (laughs) I love that. When I read that, it just gave me such relief. Um, Because if the author of Hebrews doesn't have time to speak in detail, uh, I definitely do not. So we're going to focus on what he highlights here. First, after reminding us of all the elements that are in the tabernacle in the first five verses, he then tells us what takes place. In verse six, the priests are continually entering the first part of the tabernacle, performing the divine worship. And then in verse seven, the high priest enters once a year into the Holy of Holies, where the Ark and the Mercy Seat are, to atone for sin. And we saw that when we read uh, Leviticus 16. So not only are the sacrifices happening continually all the time, but the, if you want to say the big one, the Day of Atonement, for all sins committed during the year, uh, that only happens once a year, and only the high priest gets to go into the most sacred place, the Holy of Holies. Um, And the author tells us what this means in verse 8. The Holy Spirit is indicating this, that the way into the holy places has not yet been manifested while that first part of the tabernacle is still standing. This is a bit um, difficult, this phrase, to parse out, but the basic meaning is that the tabernacle system shows that access to the dwelling of God, to unhindered communion with God, isn't possible through the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant doesn't get you there. Uh, To say it a different way, another way, while the tabernacle was a good thing for Israel, because it provided a way to worship God and to experience his presence among his people, it also showed that there was a barrier because redemption wasn't accomplished in time yet because the true sacrifice, Jesus, hadn't been offered. So the veil of the Holy of Holies is still up until Christ dies for sin. And that isn't to say that God's people who had faith in God couldn't pray to God and experience the joy of making God their refuge. You just have to read the Psalms, and you'll see that. Um, But it is showing that they still needed something more to atone for sin. Uh, Further, you see that worship is restricted. Um, Most Israelites could not go into the tabernacle, and definitely not the Holy of Holies. Um, They could bring their offering to the court of the tabernacle, and then the priests would pretty much take over from there. And when you read Leviticus, uh, you'll see that there's all sorts of normal life things which could make you unclean, um, so there's purification, purification that's happening all the time for that. Um, but what's the tabernacle pointing towards? It's pointing towards the time of reformation. That's in verse 10. That's the time of the new covenant where access to God is given unlike ever before through the blood of Christ. Those who believe on the name of Jesus, who wholly trust him as the son of God who paid for their sins by the sacrifice of himself, and then rose from the grave, those people can go directly to God for forgiveness. Each time we sin, we go directly to God, and we can trust that he forgives, and he has forgiven us all of our sin. We don't go through a priest um, because we have gone through the great high priest. Uh, 
And I think there's a point of practical application when we consider worship. I would say this, consider the old covenant, um, the worship under the old covenant and the limited access that worshipers had and the fact that every time they sinned, even those who did have saving faith in God and his promise of the Messiah, every time they sinned, they would still need to bring an offering for sin um, or they would wait for the day of atonement I entrust that the priests would do their work on their behalf. Was there joy? I'm sure there was joy um, to follow God and to walk with him in the Old Testament. Yet there's still that idea of separation from God and the reminder that sin was in that time not yet uh, fully covered, not permanently covered. Now, look at the type of worship that we get to enjoy every Sunday when we meet as a church. Um, The New Covenant transforms our worship in that those same regulations don't apply to us in Christ. There's certainly still a proper way to worship God, and each of us um, should examine our hearts to make sure we have the right um, heart attitude as we approach in worship, but I think we can still cherish the fact that when we come together, we're all together in the same place. We're praising God. We're sitting under the teaching of his word, and none of us is sitting there thinking about the sacrifices that we have to make. Um, because we see, we can look back and point to the fact that Jesus paid for all of our sins already. And that brings us great confidence. And I think for me personally, that just makes me so thankful for the corporate worship that we get to enjoy each week. And it makes me see the priority of that worship time together. But how is that possible? How is it that we can worship the Lord in this way? Well, that leads to our second point, our second accomplishment of the new covenant. And that's eternal redemption verses 11 and 12, and then 15, all the way to verse 22. So we just looked at the fact that the new covenant brings reformed worship in that it opens the door or the veil, if you want to say that, for access to God and worship that is not dependent on offerings and sacrifices and the work of other sinners on our behalf. And this section tells us how under the new covenant we now have that access. It's because Jesus obtained eternal redemption for his people. Look at verses 11 through 12. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy places once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And that was, of course, always the plan, right? Long before Moses and Abraham, God gave that promise to the first sinners, Adam and Eve, uh, that one day the seed of the woman would crush the head of Satan. That's in Genesis 3.15. The time of Israel under the Mosaic covenant was a time wherein the law that they were to follow highlighted the need for atonement and that sin was only being temporarily covered or atoned for by the blood of animals but something that's far more valuable was needed to actually remove the sin and provide eternal redemption. And that is the death of Jesus. Um, I found a really helpful illustration that I think will aid us to understand this, and it's related to the Day of Atonement, which the author of Hebrews talks about in verse 7. This is from J. Dwight Pentecost, which is a great name for a Bible scholar. He says this, We might compare the Day of Atonement to a note of indebtedness. That note fell due each year, and because the debtors were unable to pay, they asked for an extension of their indebtedness for another 12 months. In the same way, the sins of the nation accumulated year after year. The Day of Atonement did not retire the debt. It only forestalled collection for another year. But then Jesus Christ came, so that by his death he might make payment in full for those accumulated transgressions. This is why we read in verse 15, since a death has taken place for the redemption of the trespasses that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So this is a crucial verse. uh, When someone asks you, how were the Old Testament saints saved? It's by the death of Christ, just like everyone else who has ever been redeemed. Um, This has been called by some retroactive atonement because those Old Testament saints um, who had faith in God and his promise, well, they already had died before Christ, but they still needed his death and his substitutionary atonement on their behalf to pay for their sins, right? 
And I think that's just, it's so astounding to think of that. And I think I struggled, especially as a younger a girl um, who knew that Jesus was the only way to eternal life. I often would wonder, well, what about those who actually died before Jesus? Um, and I'm sure I was given the right answers, that um, it was through faith, um, like Abraham had. He believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Um, but I think now, seeing this here, it's just remarkable to consider that Jesus' death, in one point in time, covered, paid for the sins of all the people of faith. So let's look now at verses 15 through 22. Um, We're going to look, this is kind of a bloody section. Blood's mentioned 11 times in our passage. Uh, Read with me, starting at verse 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the trespasses that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never in force while the one who made it lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry he sprinkled with the blood. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Um, There's a lot in these verses, but I think you get the point, right? Blood or death is necessary for ratifying covenants and for the forgiveness of sins. And blood doesn't have mystical powers in itself. It simply refers to death. Um, Leviticus 17.11, again, we looked at that in the lesson, made that point. It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. So to shed blood is to kill something. Verses 16 and 17 might be referring to a testament or a will, which was generally uh, only carried out after the death of the one who made it. So, um, you know, you receive the inheritance once your rich uncle dies. That's kind of what that would mean. Um, or it could be talking about a covenant, as in the Old Testament covenants, where animals were killed as substitutes for the people making the covenants. But regardless, either of those, uh, the point remains that blood or death is necessary. It's needed. And the only way that the blessing of forgiveness and the eternal redemption are received are through the shed blood of Jesus. And I wonder if you've been like me and if you've ever stopped in kind of the middle of a communion service to listen to the words that we're singing. And I just wonder what that would be like for a non-Christian to be sitting there, um, listening to what we sing with such joy, right? Um, I don't think there are many experiences that have strengthened my faith as much as sitting in church and just listening to the body sing together these great truths And to remember that some of the hymns that we sing have been sung for hundreds of years, and those people that originally sang them are in heaven now. Um, I love it. Consider the words of this hymn, which we often sing on a communion Sunday. There is a fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. That has profound imagery, um, and it is showing us a profound truth. I was um, putting my little niece to bed once, and I think she was about three, and we would sing to her. Um, and for some reason, the only hymn that I could think of to sing her was There is a Fountain. <laughs> um, I don't think her mom appreciated it that much, because though the theology of that is so rich, I think the wisdom of singing it to a three-year-old um, is probably lacking. But consider the fact Uh, that we take such joy in singing that truth, in singing about the death of Christ. It's not because we're morbid. um, It's because we know it's death accomplished. What it brought us, it brought us our very life. Um, We are brought into the family of God, and we can no uh, longer be torn apart from that. We're never going to be cast aside. We always will walk in newness of life. And just as our Redeemer, as Christ lives, we also will live with him. And I think you probably have had times like I have where either the disappointments or just the sorrow of life are very great. 
and you're desiring more from life than it seems to be offering. Maybe you're desiring more from your relationships than they're giving. And you could be lonely or you might be hurt um, and not feeling like anyone really sees you. I think that's part of living in this world, in this earth. And I have had those times before, and I think what has come out of them is worth the pain. Um, Consider the words of Romans 5, 6 to 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And no one has ever died for me before or offered to die for me. That would be weird. Um, Our love often disappoints our love for others and their love toward us. And we don't always receive the care that we desire. And we will experience the pain of the loss of losing those that we, um, we love. But if you are in Christ, you are recipient of the greatest love that you can ever obtain. I think we need to realize that and remember that every other love is lesser than the love of God and of Christ. So when we're disappointed with human love, remember that you already have the very best love if you're in Christ. You have a love where the perfect son was born as a man and he lived amongst us and he never failed and he never sinned and then he died as a substitute for us to redeem us from the penalty of sin. Remember that when you are in one of those moments of despair or grief and then go to him, the one who loves you eternally, and then by the grace that he supplies, seek to love others the way that he has loved you. Well, if that wasn't enough, those first two points, there's a third thing that's accomplished by the new covenant. And we get that from verse 9 and 13 through 14, and that's a cleansed conscience. The conscience is introduced to us for the first time here in Hebrews 9. It's used twice in our text today, and then twice more in Hebrews later on. In verse 9, we're told, Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience. But then we're told that the superior offering of Jesus actually does something remarkable to the conscience. Look at verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who offered, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So, Unlike the conscience under the old covenant, the new covenant, due to the completed work of Jesus, believers can have their conscience cleansed. But what does that actually mean? Um, Well, what's the conscience? Um, You've experienced the conscience before, no doubt. It's that internal system, some would call it a moral faculty, that warns or it burdens or convicts you or alerts you about something you have done or something you are going to do. The conscience is not the Holy Spirit because it can be subject to fallibility. And it is given to all people, not just Christians, and it can be seared by being ignored. And further, the conscience must be informed by truth about what is right and what is wrong. A weak and an uninformed conscience might accuse a believer uh, unnecessarily if it's not shaped by truth. So in any case, you shouldn't go against your conscience, but you need to inform it with the word of God. And it feels really bad to have an unclean conscience. Uh, I remember at least one time when I was a kid when my cousin, Jeff, and I were exploring people's backyards, which sounds pretty weird, but (laughs) you understand we had a fence that was very old um, and dilapidated, so it was very easy to climb over. So we would explore other people's backyards. And there was one day we found these really pretty rocks, and we took them, kind of telling ourselves, well, they're rocks, so, you know, it's nature. But not five minutes after we had gotten back to my yard in our fort, my conscience began to plague me with the feeling that I was um, a thief and I was guilty. So I told my cousin we have to put the rocks back, and he thought I was crazy, but we did. And then it brought so much relief to know that the rocks were in their proper home and I was no longer a thief. I think that's normally what we think of when we're talking about the conscience, those kind of experiences. And it does help us a little bit in understanding the idea of the author here in Hebrews, 
But I think there are some differences, uh, namely when we see conscience or when we think of the conscience, um, we normally relate it to what we as an individual are doing or what we're thinking of doing that's morally right or wrong. But here, the conscience is in connection with sacrifices, the animal sacrifices under the old covenant, which are contrasted with the one-time sacrifice of Jesus under the new, wherein the sins of the believer are paid for. A commentator William Lane says this about the conscience in this text. He says, here, it is not engaged in moral decision-making, but in remembering. Although the ritual of the Day of Atonement might affect temporary relief, the renewal was short-lived. The annual repetition of the solemn ceremonies indicated that sin had come again into remembrance. So when verse 9 says that the Old Covenant sacrifices could not make the worshiper perfect in conscience, I don't think he's saying that they're Uh, It was impossible for an Old Testament saint to have a clean conscience in any way because we know that Abraham and Moses and David, they had faith in God and they knew God's character. They knew he was loving and a forgiving God and they knew that he had promised one to come uh, and defeat Satan. So when we read the first two verses of Psalm 32, you see this. You see David's confidence in the forgiveness of God. He writes, "'How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered.'" How blessed is the man whose iniquity Yahweh will not take into account and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So what's the author of Hebrews talking about then? I think it's qualitative. Uh, The saint in the new covenant can have a far greater cleansed conscience because he or she can look to the completed work of Christ on the cross and say, my sin has been dealt with there. It was paid in full. So we don't carry around Um, the burden of sin and the burden of continual offerings for sin and the continual remembrance of sin because we can point to the death of Christ to pay for our sin. But the really practical point for us comes in verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Mercy and grace should always fuel our service to God. Our forgiveness doesn't mean that we just sit around, right? We enjoy and we thank God for his mercy and for his grace in our lives, and then we offer back our lives as a living sacrifice to him. I think of Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. When we realize the full forgiveness that's been given to us through the atonement of Christ, we have a conscience that's freed from the reminder of our sin, and we can joyfully then serve God. Consider the various ways that you serve. Um, You serve God in your families, in our personal devotions, in our prayer life, in our work, and then in the body of Christ, we serve the saints. And remember that you're position, our position in Christ qualifies us, and it makes us responsible to serve him with our lives. And Christ is our example in service. He is always deserving of our worship and all honor. But what does Mark 10, 45 say about his mindset while he was on earth? Do you remember? For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So if our great high priest's and Savior's life could be characterized as one of service, shouldn't ours also be characterized that way, of one of service to God and to man? That is our goal in life, and it should direct our daily choices. All right, so we've looked at three things that are accomplished in the New Covenant. We've seen reformed worship and an eternal redemption, and we've seen that the New Covenant brought a cleansed conscience And our final point is that the new covenant accomplished an eternal inheritance. And we get this from verse 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the trespasses that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. And this is the third time that eternal, that word has been used in this passage. Remember, first there was that eternal redemption in verse 12. And then Jesus, through the eternal spirit, gave himself an offering for sin. That was in verse 14, which I think that's referring to the fact that Jesus, while he was on earth, was led by and empowered by the Holy Spirit, um, who, of course, himself is eternal and works with the Father and Son to bring about redemption 
So, what point do you think the author is making in saying eternal three times in our passage? He's contrasting the temporary old covenant, which was always designed as temporary cleansing, with Christ and the blessing that we get forever in Christ. Um, We're encouraged often in the New Testament to think about and to put our hope in our inheritance in heaven. Um, And even our title as heirs with Christ, that implies that we have an inheritance. One of my favorite passages, I'm sure you guys know this one, 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and unfading, having been kept in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So inheritance in the Old Testament often has to do with land and dwelling. Abraham was promised land, seed, and blessing. Uh, Hebrews 11, actually, we'll talk about that in a couple chapters. Israel had an inheritance in the land of promise. You see that all over the place in Exodus especially. And I do think that eternal dwelling, uh, especially in this passage, is one of the key elements of our inheritance. But there's a lot more that goes into the believer's inheritance. Just a few references. In 1 Peter 5, 4, we're told that we'll receive an unfading crown of glory. In Romans 8, 18 through 25, uh, we have redemption of our bodies, glorification. That's what awaits us. Titus 3, 7 says that we're heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And then I love this one. Psalm 16, 5 says that God is our inheritance. And then John 14, 2 to 3, Jesus says that he is preparing a place for us and will come again and take us to be with him. Pastor John gives us some help with this. I love his summaries. And regarding our inheritance, this is what he says. What's our inheritance? Life, righteousness, joy, peace, perfection, God's presence, Christ's glorious companionship, rewards, and all else. God has planned is the Christian's heavenly inheritance. But it's hard to wait. (laughs) Um, I don't like waiting. Uh, It seems that I'm always waiting for something. And I was serving in children's uh, Sunday school for first hour a while back. And there was a little boy who was having a very hard time waiting for his parents to come and get him. And it made me so sad um, trying to help him. So I was talking with him and I said, look, we've already had our lesson. Um, we've already, we're almost through the music and now we're just going to go back to our classroom and then we're almost done. And I was proud of myself for that. And then he looked at me with, you know, tears and he said, no, because then I have to wait through the second hour. And so <laughs> I didn't, I was off to main service, <laughs> but Sorry if that was your child. Um, I'm sure he was fine. All that to say, it's hard to wait for something, uh, even when we know it's coming. And sometimes on earth, the hardest thing about our waiting is that we don't always know if the things that we wait for are actually going to be accomplished. But that's why we need to anchor our waiting in the right provider and in the right object. Verse 15 tells us that because Jesus gave himself as a sacrifice for our sin— Our waiting on earth is not in vain. We will receive the promised eternal inheritance. Uh, We will one day be set free from the pain of life and our trials and our sin and our unmet desires. We will receive fullness of joy in the presence of God, and that will never be taken away and it will never be corrupted. And we've mentioned the tabernacle often today. And in Hebrews, we know that the tabernacle, it's the dwelling of God, the place where God is, and the place where God met with his people. I think it's fitting that the Bible closes with reminding us of our hope of dwelling with God in the new heavens and the new earth. Turn to Revelation 21. This comes in Revelation after all the events that are still to unfold. So you have the rapture of the church, the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon, then the thousand-year kingdom of Christ on earth, and then the final judgment and the lake of fire. After all that, this is what awaits the believer. We're going to read the first seven verses. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, 
coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, They are done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. That is the future that awaits us. But until we get there, we can wait with hope, and we can be content knowing that we are members of the new covenant. Uh, We've been cleansed from our sin, and we're free now to serve God and to worship him with our very lives. We have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, and now we get to wait in hope, and we will receive our eternal inheritance that's promised to all the saints. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you so much. We thank you for your word that instructs us how to worship and how to live. I ask that you would help these truths that we study today to sink deeply into our minds and into our hearts. I ask that you would give us courage and grace for each day and whatever you would bring, um, that we would make you known, that we would make Christ and his redemption known to those around us. Thank you for that redemption that we experience in Christ, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.